Welcome along to the Gary Neville podcast. And this week, Gary and I are at Villa Park, where we've just seen Tottenham uh, clear a 2-0 victory against Aston Villa to ease some of the pressure that they've been on this week. It was crucial they won, wasn't it, Gary? Absolutely crucial. I think it determines the sort of last couple of months of the season. I think it was that bigger game today for Spurs. I think going into that sixth place, a point behind West Ham, three points behind Chelsea, gives Jose Mourinho the the feeling that he might still do something really, really good in the league this season. I think if they hadn't have won tonight here, then they would have obviously been you know, too far away. So, look, I was just looking at the bench there again for Spurs. And you look, you know, obviously, we know the starting team tonight, but with Joe Hart, Bale, Dyer, Sissoko, Deli Alli, Bergwijn, Ben Davis. And I know Jose Mourinho mentioned two 16-year-olds before the game as being sort of you know, young players coming through, but the amount of experience and quality and depth and that's without other players that are obviously not on that bench or in the team. So they should be challenging for fourth place. They really should. And I think that Chelsea will feel a little bit of heat if Spurs get near them. And I think that they've got the type of players that could finish the season really well. And they've got good goal scorers. I, I did like Vinicius and Kane. And I thought that those two played well today. I'm not sure. I wasn't sure before the game they would. What about at the back, though? Do you feel they're still there to be got at? Yes, I think the rash. I think the rash, they always, the defenders to me always feel like they have to win the ball. And that sounds a really crazy thing. But as a defender, sometimes it's known when you can't win it. And you know, you saw a rash penalty being given away by Cash, but just sliding in. But you see Sanchez and you see Tanganga. Sometimes they go to ground and Dyer obviously has made mistakes this season. So you just got defenders in there that, the thing about defenders is reliability, consistency and trust. And you watch Tottenham and you think they look like individually, it would be difficult to play against them one-on-one, -on -one, but they're not really a unit yet. And you think of Jose Mourinho's best teams, particularly the Chelsea ones that he's had, and they've had really good back fours. Um, and there's that solidity to them and that sort of reliability and someone that it all hangs off. You know, great back fours have someone that just holds it all together and he hasn't got that man. He just hasn't got that one at the back that just everyone else sort of get, gains that confidence from. Van Dijk at Liverpool, company... At Manchester City, uh, Vidic, obviously, or Ferdinand at Manchester United, or Stam, you know, Bruce, all these players over the years that have formed great back fours that you've seen, John Terry at Chelsea. You just know that they hold it together. Their arms go out wide, and that's where the line is. They say to get up, you get up, and they keep that four acting as one. Whereas I think with Spurs, you still look at them and think that they're four individual defenders operating. OK, not doing badly. They've kept a clean sheet tonight. But you just always feel like there's a rash moment in them that could give you a chance. Ironically, do you think there's less rashness perhaps in the central defensive partnership of the home team here where you've got Konza and Mings? Konza actually is a, a player who allegedly is a Tottenham fan has, has actually been linked with a move to Spurs. They were good. They're very good. As I say, I think... If you're Dean Smith and you're looking at sort of the general performance, I know coaches will always go and look back and think, well, what did we want to do in this game and did we do it? There'll be a lot of things that Dean Smith looks at in the analysis of this game where he thinks we were really good. However, it's those moments in the match and those moments are determined and defined by players, the quality of the player that you have. And Tottenham just have better players in that final moment, whether it be the Kane pass back to Moore and then the Moore slot across for Vinicius for the first goal, or whether it be Kane's just wily, cute, clever some might say snidey, <laughs> uh, winning of a penalty. Um, but I think he'll be really happy. That centre-back pairing are a good centre-back pairing. They really are. They just like that little bit of quality in that game today to go and finish it off. And I think Grealish is playing and at his best. Then Villa really do cause Tottenham a lot of problems, particularly in that first half an hour when it felt like Tottenham were waiting to get started and they didn't look happy in the game. But then that goal just gave them the comfort just to rise. The second goal, they really grew... It shouldn't need to be like that, but sometimes it is. They've had a tough week, Spurs, and they needed those two goals at those moments in the game. The outspoken comments of uh, Jose Mourinho when he criticised his players and Hugo Lloris in particular, who was probably even more vehement in his criticism, have got a reaction. If they hadn't, I think there probably would have been a lot more questions asked about those outbursts. How, as a former player, did you feel about them? Well, we had a manager that, at times, he would never uh, criticise individuals. Uh, but there'll be certainly times whereby we fell below our standard. You know, I remember when we lost, when I gave the ball away to Sean Golter in the derby and he was very, I think his words in that game were I should let the fans come in and at, and at them at the end of the game. Um, I remember having getting knocked out of Champions League games by, say, Bayern Munich and Roy Keane was very critical of us. 
So I do remember big moments where we let ourselves down, where we didn't perform in big matches, where the manager would be critical of us and say, that's not good enough. That's not the standard of Manchester United. It was very rarely personal. In fact, it was never personal, sorry. It was never individual, uh, individually against one person or one player. Um, but there would be a real... So you'd know. I mean, the, the ferocity in the dressing room would be far more severe than what you would see out there in the actual interview. But there comes a time when you've lost like they did on Thursday in a game where Jose Mourinho and a competition that he'll have wanted to do well in and Lloris will have wanted to do well in. They'll have been massively disappointed. And sometimes you have to come out and represent the fans that you're obviously playing for and you've got to you they've got to know you care simple as that the fans have to know that when you're wearing that badge on that shirt that you're representing them and that you're doing the best for them and if they don't see that then it's not a good place to be a football club and I think that from Lloris he's the captain the manager after a defeat like that you'd want to see some passion I think that ultimately as long as I say it stays clear of what would be the personal which I think it did I think then it's fine Talking of uh, wanting to see some passion, obviously uh, it's been a limited Premier League weekend. Uh, one, one of the few games that yeah. has taken place was the Brighton-Newcastle uh, match. Mm. And I think there was probably a big expectation around that Steve Bruce's job could have been in real jeopardy after that defeat and the manner of it. But it looks as though Mike Ashley is standing by his man. Is that something that you applaud? Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, I think that, that Mike Ashley is uh, likely to do that at this moment in time and not panic. Uh, I think he expects to be down there, uh, not down there right near the bottom and not certainly fighting for relegation. But I don't think he expects to be in the top half of the table. Uh, the injuries in the last few weeks, I think, have been a, a difficult one for Steve Bruce to contend with. Um, but they've got a real fight on. They've got a real fight on. And I think that obviously Fulham uh, losing to Leeds the other night was a good one for Newcastle. But they can't keep relying upon other results. At some point, they're going to have to go and win points themselves. And that's going to have to happen quickly. But has it got to the point now where you think that if they were going to make a change, the international break was the opportunity to do it? So now there's almost no point making a change. No, I, I can't see them making a change. This would be the point where you've got two, three weeks and you basically reset and you get a new manager in. This would be the point to do it. And if they said they're not going to do it, I doubt they're going to do it at this point. I mean, the fans, we know what the fans think up there. We know that they're you know really unhappy with the situation, just generally in the club, but also with the manager. And they would, I think, support a change. But that's not going to happen, it looks like. Now, of course, the reason why there haven't been many Premier League matches is because the FA Cup has also uh, been part of the weekend's football. Uh, first of all, of course, I have to ask you, <laughs> Manchester United, another real roller coaster week going from Milan to then the yeah. defeat at Leicester. Yeah, I mean, it's been a good week. Um, not surprising that they go to Milan and do what they did because they're good away from home, um, beating West Ham last week. And then you think, I'm surprised that the team was weakened and I'm surprised that the team was rotated as much. I know he has been doing that, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, but this was a real chance. And when you think about the semi-final draw that occurred at half-time in that game, which you know meant that the winner of the game between Leicester and Manchester United played Southampton, you just thought, I mean, it's not a gimme against Southampton in the, sem in the semi-final by any stretch of the imagination, but what an opportunity. And I genuinely do believe that group of players need to win a trophy under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Yes, of course, finishing second would be the priority at the start of the season. But winning a trophy with that would be a real priority. Now they've only got the Europa League left. But that was a that was a good one today to sort of go and, you know, Leicester got a decent record at Leicester. And, you know, I was in the car sort of listening to it on the radio and thinking, oh, they got back into the game and I'm thinking, here we go. You know, they go behind. You're not, not surprised with United away from home going behind. And then they come back and you think, and then you see the second one and the third one and you think that that'll be a massive missed opportunity or could be a massive missed opportunity. And there'll be some really, I am, I'm demoralised a little bit as a United fan tonight because I just felt that was a, that was a really good one to go for this season. Also, I think there comes a point whereby if you're going to catch Manchester City, you've got to beat them. You've got to beat them in a big game, in a big competition. You know, Spurs have got that opportunity in a few weeks to win in a final. And if Manchester United and, you know, and Manchester City are going to get to a final of a competition, I know they've got Chelsea to beat. Manchester United have got to be there to stop them. You, you can't rely on other teams to stop them. If you're the second best team in the country and you've got a decent, half-decent record against City, which United and Oligan Solskjaer has, then you've got to be there the ones to stop them. If you think about in 99 when Arsenal had won the double the year before, you know, we were the only team that could stop them in the semi-final. We, we did stop them here. Hard work, but we stopped them. Same in the league. 
you, know, you can't rely upon other teams to stop them for you. And if you're going to catch teams, you've got to leave one on them. And I'm, I'm disappointed with that tonight. I think Manchester United fans are. I know, and I know they're disappointed. I've seen the reaction <laughs> on social media as I was walking over and up to the gantry here. And with the kind of form that Chelsea are in at the moment, still unbeaten under Thomas Tuchel, their, their place in the league table could still come under threat, couldn't it? It could. It could. I mean, I think that still Manchester United are the second best team in the country. I do think that it could come under threat. But I just feel that United will have enough to get there in the end. Um, and I think at the, at the end of this season, the, the purpose of Manchester United, I said it a few weeks ago, is to finish a good second, not a bad second. You know, if they finish below second, then I think it'll be a real disappointment. But I think the position that they're in now is to finish as close to Manchester City as possible. It does matter how close you finish to them because it is played back at the end of the season. Oh, you finish 16 points off them, 26 points off them. You've got to try and get to within single figures so you then think, well, OK, where could we make up those four points, those eight points? And you can see that. You can see that. You can visualise it. I think when we used to lose leagues, you used to think, oh, well, where could we put this right? Is it our away form? Did we, get sent, did we get two or three players sent off in certain games and, and drop points? And you can point towards it. When you're 16, 17 points, there's no point in looking. Whereas actually when you're a few points away within sort of seven or eight or nine, you can think, well, yeah, Crystal Palace at home, Sheffield United. I think we can turn those ones round. So they're the ones, that's why it's been really important that they finish in a strong second place. Um, but let's see what happens. Well, you had that great season in 99 with the treble. How credible is the quadruple for Manchester City. The league is theirs. You can't say the FA Cup is theirs, but what a chance. What a chance. Um, and the Champions League is the one that's always the most difficult to connect with the other two. The double's been done a few times, you know, the league and FA Cup double. Uh, but the actual European Cup to connect with that has been always the problem. Um, and we'll see what City can do. They're good enough. They've got the talent. They've got the squad. Uh, I just think that in the Champions League, there's always a team that can come and do you and do what Manchester United did to them in the league a few weeks ago. So they've got a chance. It's tough to, tough to do because it'll come to a point whereby these big weeks, it becomes that as the sort of the season ends, every week is a big week and every week you can be out of a competition you know, more often than not. The Champions League obviously will just kick on and it'll just roll on week for week. The FA Cup semi-final will then hit you and the league games, obviously, I think the league's in the bag. But the cup competitions will come thick and fast and it'll be a case of every game you lose at that point, the treble's off or the treble's on. Uh, and that's where it got to for us and we obviously whittled the games down one by one and the City are capable of doing it. I don't think they'll ever get a better chance. I don't think they'll ever get a better chance. It's, it's there for them, particularly in two competitions. It's as comfortable as it could be, I think. Chelsea, I can't write them off, but I think they can beat Chelsea. We saw, I saw the Chelsea game at Stamford Bridge and City was so much better. What about the one final they're already in? I mean, we, we've seen Spurs today. Do you think that um, a Jose Mourinho side is always going to be dangerous to uh, Manchester City? They have beaten them once already, of course, in the Premier League this season. Yes. Yeah, I do think, I th I do think Tottenham on a, on a, on a one-off day can do something. They've got match winners. They've got match winners. They've got players who can counter-attack. They've got players who, I think, can live off three or four attacks. We've seen that in parts of this game, where a mistake, a counter-attack, a bit of Kane brilliance. You know, they've got the type of players with Son and Kane that they might only need three chances in the game to score two. You know, they are lethal. Um, I think that's what you need to do against City. And I think with the likes of Bergwijn and Mora, Son, they can counter-attack as well. So the teams that do well against City are the ones who've got real electric players who can get back into their shape quickly, but then get up to the other end of the pitch quickly and sort of break that what would be counter-press that City have. So for me, yes, Tottenham are a team that can cause them problems. Do I think they will? Well, I'm not sure, because to be fair, I think City will win. But they are one of the teams that I do look at and think that they've got the the type of players that can, that can, that can beat Manchester City on a one-off. Uh, final day. Just finally, Gary, because uh, I know the, the PFA is a, an organisation that for a long time has been close to your heart. And there's been a lot of talk this week about the recruitment process of a new chief executive. Now, obviously, it's a big role to be filled. It's been filled for a, a lifetime, really, by Gordon Taylor. What, what have you made about the reaction to the impending appointment? I thought it was an awful reaction. I mean, I saw it sort of when it first broke and I thought, well, there's just a bit of the language I just didn't like. It was a little bit sort of derogatory, a little bit disparaging. You know, almost like, who is this guy? How's he got the job type language? And then it sort of seemed to sort of go on for another day. And I thought, 
it's a bit of a concerted attack. I mean, do, do they know this? You know, Maheta, I've never met Maheta in my life. I don't know who he is. You know, surely the British media don't know him. They're ringing up people in Spain, apparently, or they're speaking to people within the PFA who obviously don't want to, you know, give maybe a glowing recommendation. And I think it got to the third or fourth there, and I thought, enough's enough. It, it, it's, it's just not right, this. Um, the PFA is a really, really strong union. It's a really strong union. It needs the players to re-engage with it. You know, when I was a member of the management committee, I was 22 years of age at Manchester United, one of the very young players in the team, but I demonstrated leadership qualities in the youth teams. And at the time, I think maybe Eric Cantona was the captain at the time. And Brian McClare was the PFA rep, and I think he was leaving the club, 22, 23 years of age. And Brian McClare said to me, he said, I'd like you to be the union rep. You know, in the in the youth teams, I've been the one that had been the foreman standing up for the you know the players with Eric Harrison and Nobby Styles, and um, I took the job on as of being the PFA union rep, and I went on to the management committee of the PFA. And there were times in two, early 2000s where we had to threaten to go on strike to protect the players' rights, um, and that's not that wasn't a time where the players we're talking about players' rights being players on 200 grand a week. We're talking about the players who get kicked out of the game. You know, there is a massive amount of young players who get kicked out of the game and the PFA funds their education, their well-being, their mental health support that they need through the sort of distress that they get caused from the dream being shattered. And then you've got the players who are 65, 70, 55, who have hip operations or life-saving operations or have needs of other ways. And the PFA is there to support its members. And it's important that football, do, you know, football does that and that the PFA do that. So we threatened to go on strike to protect the players' rights. And then you think about sort of the last five, ten years where the, the, the money's got to a, a really high level, a big level, and there's less, I don't know, there's less love for the players in that sense. But we should still think about those players who need it, the, the younger ones in the game who sort of, like you say, do need that support. And to me, Gordon Taylor has been a great servant for the game, a great servant for the PFA. But we've surely got to, as members and ex-members, welcome. It's difficult enough as it is following someone who's been there for a long time, but we've surely, as ex-members, I've not seen anybody quoted within the PFA. I've not seen a quote from any of the executives from the PFA. I've not seen a quote from anybody saying, we welcome Maheta to, 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 to England. We welcome him to come and look after the PFA. We welcome him to come and look after our union. I've not seen any of the players out on this pitch or any other pitch in the country. Where are you all? You know, the media are absolutely blasting your new guy, the guy who's going to come in and take the union forward in a difficult time, in the middle of a pandemic, where there's big charity commission investigations, there's been an independent review with what would be recommendations to come out of it. And there needs to pull together. Football players should pull together. And so for me, I just think that it, I felt as though I needed to speak out the other day. I felt passionate about it. I've always been somebody who supported the PFA. I'm a club owner now, so you could argue that I'm in direct conflict <laughs> with players at times, but I still feel like a player and I still speak like a player and I still look at everything that I look at on the pitch as a player. You know, I've been there tonight where you know, you've, I've dived in for a penalty and I've thought, oh no, stand up, don't be rash, because I've been there, I've done it. I dived in against Steven Gerrard against Liverpool and tripped him up. But I was really disappointed with the reaction to it, really disappointed with the lack of support from within the PFA to say, no, let's stop this. Come on, we're pulled together. There's got to be a smooth transition out of Gordon's reign to a new dawn for the PFA. And I, I, I just didn't think it was right. And um, definitely an element of what's this guy doing here? Who's this? You know, xenophobia, disparaging, um, unsavoury, uh, and enough's enough. And to be fair, now every time I see someone talk about it, look, he's got to do the job correctly. He's got to do the job correctly. When he comes over, you know, there'll be an element of pressure. But at least let start first. Um, and I didn't feel it was fair and right. Um, and I hope that Mehta has a really good introduction. I hope he's looked after internally. I hope he's supported by the members. I hope he's validated by the members first. And then I hope he's supported by all the members, the Premier League players, the League, the League One and Two players and the Championship players. Because it's needed. There needs to be a strong union. Because for every single player that's Harry Kane or Jack Grealish, there is 50, 60, 70 kids who aren't in that position, who really do need the support to get through their lives, who have put all their eggs in one basket to be a football player. OK, Gary, thanks very much indeed. Thank and thanks for joining us all on the Gary Neville podcast.